Chapter Six of Mount Royal, Volume Two by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: That Lip and Voice Are Mute Forever. Having pledged herself to remain with her aunt to the end, Christabel was fain to make the best of her life at Mount Royal, and in order to do this, she must needs keep on good terms with her cousin. Leonard's conduct of late had been irreproachable; he was attentive to his mother, all amiability to Christabel and almost civil to miss bridgeman he contrived to make his peace with randy and he made such a good impression upon major bree that he won the warm praises of that gentleman the cross-country rides were resumed the major always in attendance and leonard and his cousin were so often together riding driving or walking that the idea of an engagement between them became a fixture in the local mind which held that when one was off with the old love it was well to be on with the new and so the summer ripened and waned mrs tregonell's health seemed to improve in the calm happiness of a domestic life in which there was no indication of disunion she had never surrendered her hope of christabel's relenting leonard's frank and generous character his good looks his local popularity must ultimately prevail over the memory of another that other having so completely given up his chances mrs tregonell was half inclined to recognize the nobleness of that renunciation half disposed to accept it as a proof that angus hamley's heart still hankered after the actress who had been his first infatuation in either case no one could doubt that it was well for christabel to be released from such an engagement to wed angus would have been to tie herself to sickness and death to take upon herself the burden of early widowhood to put on sackcloth and ashes as a wedding garment it was winter and there were patches of snow upon the hills and sea and sky were of one chill slaty hue before leonard ventured to repeat that question which he had asked with such ill effect in the sweet summer morning between hedgerows flushed with roses but through all the changes of the waning year there had been one purpose in his mind and every act of his life had tended to one result he had sworn to himself that his cousin should be his wife whatever barriers of disinclination direct antagonism even there might be on her side must be broken down by dogged patience unyielding determination on his side he had the spirit of the hunter to whom that prey is most precious which costs the longest chase he loved his cousin more passionately to-day after keeping his feelings in check for six months than he had loved her when he had asked her to be his wife every day of delay had increased his ardour and strengthened his resolve it was new year's day christabel and miss bridgeman had been to church in the morning and had taken a long walk with leonard who contrived to waylay them at the church door after church they had come a rather late luncheon after which christabel spent an hour in her aunt's room reading to her and talking a little in a subdued way it was one of mrs tregonell's bad days a day upon which she could hardly leave her sofa and christabel came away from the invalid's room full of sadness she was sitting by the fire in the library alone in the dusk save for randy's company when her cousin came in and found her why bell what are you doing all alone in the dark he exclaimed i almost thought the room was empty ah i have been thinking she said with a sigh your thoughts could not have been over pleasant i should think by that sigh said leonard coming over to the hearth and drawing the logs together there's a cheerful blaze for you don't give way to sad thoughts on the first day of the year bell it's a bad beginning i have been thinking of your dear mother leonard my mother for she has been more to me than one mother in a hundred is to her daughter she is with us to-day a part of our lives very frail and feeble but still our own where will she be next new year's day ah oh, bell that's a bad lookout for both of us answered leonard seating himself in his mother's empty chair i'm afraid she won't last out the year that begins to-day but she has seemed brighter and happier lately hasn't she yes i think she has been happier said christabel do you know why his cousin did not answer him she sat with her face bent over her dog hiding her tears on randy's sleek black head i think i know why the mother has been so tranquil in her mind lately bell said leonard with unusual earnestness and i think you know just as well as i do she has seen you and me more friendly together more cousinly and she has looked forward to the fulfilment of an old wish and dream of hers she has looked for the speedy realization of that wish bell although six months ago it seemed hopeless she wants to see the two people she loves best on earth united before she is taken away it would make the close of her life happy if she could see my happiness secure i believe you know that bell 
yes i know that it is so but that can never be that is a hard saying christabel half a year ago i asked you a question and you said no many a man in my position would have been too proud to run the risk of a second refusal he would have gone away in a huff and found comfort somewhere else but i knew there was only one woman in the world who could make me happy and i waited for her you must own that i have been patient have i not bell you have been very devoted to your dear mother very good to me i cannot deny that leonard christabel answered gravely she had dried her tears and lifted her head from the dog's neck and sat looking straight at the fire self-possessed and sad it seemed to her as if all possibility of happiness had gone out of her life am i to have no reward asked leonard you know with what hope i have waited you know that our marriage would make my mother happy that it would make the end of her life a festival you owe me nothing but you owe her something that is suing in forma pauperis isn't it bell but i have no pride where you are concerned you ask me to be your wife you don't even ask if i love you said christabel bitterly what if i were to say yes and then tell you afterwards that my heart still belongs to angus hamley you had better tell me that now if it is so said leonard his face darkening in the firelight then i will tell you that it is so i gave him up because i thought it my duty to give him up i believed that in honour he belonged to another woman i believe so still but i have never left off loving him that is why i have made up my mind never to marry you are wise retorted leonard such a confession as that would settle for most men but it does not settle for me bell i am too far gone if you are a fool about hamley i am a fool about you only say you will marry me and i will take my chance of all the rest i know you will be a good wife and i will be a good husband to you and i suppose in the end you will get to care for me a little one thing is certain that i can't be happy without you so i would gladly run the risk of an occasional taste of misery with you come bell is it a bargain he pleaded taking her unresisting hands say that it is dearest let me kiss the future mistress of mount royal he bent over and kissed her kissed those lips which had once been sacred to angus hamley which she had sworn in her heart should be kissed by no other man upon earth she recoiled from him with a shiver of disgust no good omen for their wedded bliss this will make our mother very happy said leonard come to her now bell and let us tell her christabel went with slow reluctant steps ashamed of the weakness which had yielded to persuasion and not to duty but when mrs tregonell heard the news from the triumphant lover the light of happiness that shone upon the wan face was almost an all-sufficing reward for this last sacrifice my love my love cried the widow clasping her knees to her breast you have made my last earthly days happy i have thought you cold and hard i feared that i should die before you relented but now you have made me glad and grateful i reared you for this i taught you for this i have prayed for this ever since you were a child i have prayed that my son might have a pure and perfect wife and god has granted my prayer after this came a period of such perfect content and tranquillity for the invalid that christabel forgot her own sorrows she lived in an atmosphere of gladness congratulations gifts were pouring in upon her every day her aunt petted and cherished her was never weary of praising and caressing her leonard was all submission as a lover major brie was delighted at the security which this engagement promised for the carrying on of the line of champernowns and tregonells the union of two fine estates he had looked forward to a dismal period when the widow would be laid in her grave her son a wanderer and christabel a resident at plymouth or bath while spiders wove their webs in shadowy corners of the good old manor-house and mice to all appearance self-sustaining scampered and scurried behind the panelling jessie bridgman was the only member of christabel's circle who refrained from any expression of approval did i not tell you that you must end by marrying him she exclaimed did i not say that if you stayed here the thing was inevitable continual dropping will wear away a stone the stone is a fixture and can't help being dropped upon but if you had stuck to your colours and gone to leipzig to study the piano you would have escaped the dropping 
as there was no possible reason for delay while there was a powerful motive for a speedy marriage in the fact of mrs tregonell's precarious health and her ardent desire to see her son and her niece united before her fading eyes closed for ever upon earth and earthly cares christabel was fain to consent to the early date which her aunt and her lover proposed and to allow all arrangements to be hurried on with that view so in the dawning of the year when proserpine's returning footsteps were only faintly indicated by pale snowdrops and early violets lurking in sheltered hedges and by the gold and purple of crocuses in all the cottage gardens christabel put on her wedding-gown and whiter than the pale ivory tint of the soft sheeny satin took her seat in the carriage beside her adopted mother to be driven down into the valley and up the hilly street where all the inhabitants of beaucastle save those who had gone on before to congregate by the lich gate were on the alert to see the bride go by mrs tregonell was paler than her niece the fine regular features blanched with that awful pallor which tells of disease but her eyes were shining with a light of gladness my darling she murmured as they drove down to the harbour bridge i have loved you all your life but never as i love you to-day my dearest you have filled my soul with content i thank god that it should be so faltered christabel if i could only see you smile dear said her aunt your expression is too sad for a bride is it auntie but marriage is a serious thing dear it means the dedication of a life to duty duty which affection will make very light i hope said mrs tregonell chilled by the cold statuesque face wrapped in its cloudy veil christabel my love tell me that you are not unhappy that this marriage is not against your inclination it is of your own free will that you give yourself to my boy yes of my own free will answered christabel firmly as she spoke it flashed upon her that iphigenia would have given the same answer before they led her to the altar of offended artemis there are sacrifices offered with the victim's free consent which are not the less sacrifices look dear cried her aunt as the children clustering at the schoolhouse gate dismissed from school an hour before their time waved their sturdy arms and broke into a shrill treble cheer everybody is pleased at this marriage if you are glad dearest i am content murmured her niece it was a very quiet wedding or a wedding which ranks among quiet weddings nowadays when nuptial ceremonies are for the most part splendid no train of bridesmaids in aesthetic colours duchess of devonshire hats and long mittens no page-boys staggering under gigantic baskets of flowers no fuss or fashion to make that solemn ceremony a rare show for the gaping crowd the rector of trevalga's two little girls were the only bridesmaids dressed after sir joshua in short-waisted dove-coloured frocks and pink sashes mob caps and mittens with big bunches of primroses and violets in their chubby hands mrs tregonell looked superb in a dark ruby velvet gown and long mantle of the same rich stuff bordered with darkest sable it was she who gave her niece away while major brie acted as best man for leonard there were no guests at this winter wedding mrs tregonell's frail health was a sufficient reason for the avoidance of all pomp and show and christabel had pleaded earnestly for a very quiet wedding so before that altar where she had hoped to pledge herself for life until death to angus hamley christabel gave her submissive hand to leonard tregonell while the fatal words were spoken which have changed and blighted some few lives to set against the many they have blessed and glorified still deadly pale the bride went with the bridegroom to the vestry to sign that book of fate the register mrs tregonell following on major brie's arm miss bridgman a neat little figure in silver-grey poplin and the child bridesmaids crowding in after them until a small vestry was filled with a gracious group all glow of colour and sheen of silk and satin in the glad spring sunshine now mrs tregonell said the major cheerily when the bride and groom had signed let us have your name next if you please for i don't think there is any of us who more rejoices in this union than you do the widow took the pen and wrote her name below that of christabel with a hand that never faltered the incumbent of minster used to say afterwards that this autograph was the grandest in the register but the pen dropped suddenly from the hand that had guided it so firmly mrs tregonell looked round at the circle of faces with a strange wild look in her own she gave a faint half-stifled cry and fell upon her son's breast her arms groping about his shoulders feebly 
as if they would fain have wound themselves round his neck but could not encumbered by the heavy mantle leonard put his arm round her and held her firmly to his breast dear mother are you ill he asked alarmed by that strange look in the haggard face it is the end she faltered don't be sorry dear i am so happy and thus with a shivering sigh the weary heart throbbed its last dull beat the faded eyes grew dim the lips were dumb for ever the rector tried to get christabel out of the vestry before she could know what had happened but the bride was clinging to her aunt's lifeless figure half sustained in leonard's arms half resting on the chair which had been pushed forward to support her as she sank upon her son's breast vain to seek to delay the knowledge of sorrow all was known to christabel already as she bent over that marble face which was scarcely whiter than her own End of chapter 6chapter seven of mount royal volume two by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven not the gods can shake the past there was a sad silent week of waiting before the bride set forth upon her bridal tour robed in deepest mourning for six days the windows of mount royal were darkened and leonard and his newly wedded wife kept within the shadow of that house of death almost as strictly as if they had been jewish mourners bound by ancient ceremonial laws whereof the close observance is a kind of patriotism among a people who have no fatherland all the hothouses of mount royal gave out their treasures white hyacinths and rose flush cyclamen gardenia waxen camellias faint dijon roses for the adornment of the death chamber the corridor outside that darkened room had an odour of hothouse flowers the house folded in silence and darkness felt like some splendid sepulchre leonard was deeply depressed by his mother's death more shocked by its suddenness by this discordant note in his triumphant marriage song than by the actual fact this loss having been long discounted in his own mind among the evils of the future christabel's grief was terrible albeit she had lived for the last year in constant fear of this affliction its bitterness was in no wise lessened because it had been long expected never even in her saddest moments had she realized the agony of that parting the cold dull sense of loneliness of dismal abandonment in a loveless joyless world when that one beloved friend was taken from her leonard tried his best to console her putting aside his own sorrow in the endeavour to comfort his bride but his efforts at consolation were not happy for the most part taking the form of philosophical truisms which may be very good in an almanac or as padding for a country newspaper but which sound dull and meaningless to the ear of the mourner who says in his heart there was never any sorrow like unto my sorrow in the low sunlight of the march afternoon they laid mrs tregonell's coffin in the family vault beside the niche where her faithful husband of ten years wedded life took his long last rest there in the darkness the perfume of many flowers mixing with the cold earthy odours of the tomb they left her who had so long been the despotic mistress of mount royal and then they drove back to the empty house where the afternoon light that streamed in through newly opened windows had a garish look as if it had no right to be there the widow's will was of the simplest she left legacies to the old servants her wardrobe with the exception of laces and furs to dormer mementos to a few old friends two thousand pounds in trust for certain small local charities to christabel all her jewels and books and to her son everything else of which she died possessed he was now by inheritance from his mother and in right of his wife master of the champernown estate which united to the tregonell property made him one of the largest landowners in the west of england christabel's fortune had been strictly settled on herself before her marriage with reversion to leonard in the failure of children but the fact of the settlement to which he had readily agreed did not lessen leonard's sense of importance as representative of the tregonells and champernowns christabel and her husband started for the continent on the day after the funeral leonard fervently hoping that change of scene and constant movement would help his wife to forget her grief it was a dreary departure for a honeymoon tour the sombre dress of bride and bridegroom the doleful visage of dormer the late mrs tregonell's faithful maid whom the present mrs tregonell retained for her own service glad to have a person about her who had so dearly loved the dead they travelled to weymouth crossed to cherbourg and thence to paris and on without stopping to bordeaux 
then following the line southward they visited all the most interesting towns of southern france albi montauban toulouse carcassonne narbonne montpellier nisme and so the fairy-like shores of the mediterranean lingering on their way to look at medieval cathedrals roman baths and amphitheatres citadels prisons palaces aqueducts all somewhat dry as dust and tiresome to leonard but full of interest to christabel who forgot her own griefs as she pored over these relics of pagan and christian history nice was in all its glory of late spring when after a lingering progress they arrived at that brighton of the south it was nearly six weeks since that march sunset which had lighted the funeral procession in minster churchyard and christabel was beginning to grow accustomed to the idea of her aunt's death nay had begun to look back with a dim sense of wonder at the happy time in which they two had been together their love unclouded by any fear of doom and parting that last year of mrs tregonell's life had been christabel's apprenticeship to grief all the gladness and thoughtlessness of youth had been blighted by the knowledge of an inevitable parting a farewell that must soon be spoken a dear hand clasped fondly to-day but which must be let go to-morrow under that soft southern sky a faint bloom came back to christabel's cheeks which had not until now lost the wan whiteness they had worn on her wedding-day she grew more cheerful talked brightly and pleasantly to her husband and put off the aspect of gloom with the heavy crape shrouded gown which marked the first period of her mourning she came down to dinner one evening in a gown of rich lustreless black silk with a cluster of cape jasmine among the folds of her white crape fichu whereat leonard rejoiced exceedingly his being one of those philosophic minds which believe that the two brief days of the living should never be frittered away upon lamentations for the dead you're looking uncommonly jolly bell said leonard as his wife took her seat at the little table in front of an open window overlooking the blue water and the amphitheatre of hills glorified by the sunset they were dining at a private table in the public room of the hotel leonard having a fancy for the life and bustle of the table d'hote rather than the seclusion of his own apartments christabel hated sitting down with a herd of strangers so by way of compromise they dined at their own particular table and looked on at the public banquet as at a stage play enacted for their amusement there were others who preferred the exclusiveness of a separate table among these two middle-aged men one military both new arrivals who sat within earshot of mr and mrs tregonell that's a fascinating get-up bell pursued leonard proud of his wife's beauty and not displeased at a few respectful glances from the men at the neighbouring table which that beauty had elicited by the by why shouldn't we go to the opera to-night they do traviata none of your wagner stuff but one of the few operas a fellow can understand it will cheer you up a bit thank you leonard you are very good to think of it but i had rather not go to any place of amusement this year that's rank rubbish bell what can it matter here where nobody knows us and do you suppose it can make any difference to my poor mother her sleep will be none the less tranquil i know that but it pleases me to honour her memory i will go to the opera as often as you like next year leonard you may go or stay away so far as i'm concerned answered leonard with a sulky air i only suggested the thing on your account i hate their squalling this was not the first time that mr tregonell had shown the cloven foot during that prolonged honeymoon he was not actually unkind to his wife he indulged her fancies for the most part even when they went counter to his he would have loaded her with gifts had she been willing to accept them he was the kind of spouse who in the estimation of the outside world passes as a perfect husband proud fond indulgent lavish just the kind of husband whom a sensuous selfish woman would consider absolutely adorable from a practical standpoint supplementing him perhaps with the ideal in the person of a lover so far christabel's wedded life had gone smoothly for in the measure of her sacrifice she had included obedience and duty after marriage yet there was not an hour in which she did not feel the utter want of sympathy between her and the man she had married not a day in which she did not discover his inability to understand her to think as she thought to see as she saw religion conscience honour for all these husband and wife had a different standard that which was right to one was wrong to the other their sense of the beautiful their estimation of art were as wide apart as earth and heaven how can any union prove happy how could there be even that smooth peacefulness which blesses some passionless unions when the husband and wife were of so different a clay long as leonard had known and loved his cousin 
he was no more at home with her than he would have been with undine or with that ivory image which aphrodite warmed into life at the prayer of pygmalion the sculptor more than once during these six weeks of matrimony leonard had betrayed a jealous temper which threatened evil in the future his courtship had been one long struggle of self-repression marriage gave him back his liberty and he used it on more than one occasion to sneer at his wife's former lover or at her fidelity to a cancelled vow christabel had understood his meaning only too well but she had heard him in a scornful silence which was more humiliating than any other form of reproof after that offer of the opera mr tregonell lapsed into silence his subjects for conversation were not widely varied and his present position aloof from all sporting pursuits and poorly provided with the london papers reduced him almost to dumbness just now he was silent from temper and went on sulkily with his dinner pretending to be absorbed by consideration of the wines and dishes most of which he pronounced abominable when he had finished his dinner he took out his cigarette case and went out on the balcony to smoke leaving christabel sitting alone at her little table the two englishmen at the table in the next window were talking in a comfortable genial kind of way and in voices quite loud enough to be overheard by their immediate neighbours the soldier-like man sat back to back with christabel and she could not avoid hearing the greater part of his conversation she heard with listless ears neither understanding nor interested in understanding the drift of his talk her mind far away in the home she had left a desolate and ruined home as it seemed to her now that her aunt was dead but by and by the sound of a too familiar name riveted her attention angus hamley yes i saw his name in the visitor's book he was here last month gone on to italy said the soldier you knew him asked the other dans le temps i saw a good deal of him when he was about town went a mucker didn't he i believe he spent a good deal of money but he never belonged to an out-and-out -out fast lot went in for art and literature and that kind of thing don't you know garrick club behind the scenes at the swell theatres richmond and greenwich dinners maidenhead henley lived in a houseboat one summer men used to go down by the last train to moonlit suppers after the play he had some very good ideas and carried them out on a large scale but he never dropped money on cards or racing rather looked down upon the amusements of the million by the by i was at rather a curious wedding just before i left london whose little fishkey's the colonel came up to time at last fishkey interrogated the civilian vaguely don't you know fishkey alias Syke, the name by which stella mayne condescended to be known by her intimate friends during the run of cupid and Syke. colonel luscombe married her last week at st george's and i was at the wedding rather feeble of him wasn't it asked the civilian well you see he could hardly sink himself lower than he had done already by his infatuation for the lady he knew that all his chances at the horse guards were gone so if a plain gold ring could gratify a young person who had been surfeited with diamonds why should our friend withhold that simple and inexpensive ornament whether the lady and gentleman will be any the happier for this rehabilitation of their domestic circumstances is a question that can only be answered in the future the wedding was decidedly queer in what way it was a case of vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself the colonel wanted a quiet wedding i think he would have preferred the registrar's office no church-going or fuss of any kind but the lady to whom matrimony was a new idea willed otherwise so she decided that the nest in st john's wood was not spacious enough to accommodate the wedding guests she sent her invitations far and wide and ordered a recherche breakfast at an hotel in brook street of the sixty people she expected about fifteen appeared and there was a rowdy air about those select few male and female which was by no means congenial to the broad glare of day night birds every one painted cheeks dyed mustachios tremulous hands a foreshadowing of del trem in the very way some of them swallowed their champagne i was sorry for fishkey who looked lovely in her white satin frock and orange blossoms but who had a piteous droop about the corners of her lips like a child whose birthday feast has gone wrong i felt sorrier still for the colonel a proud man debased by low surroundings he will take her off the stage i suppose suggested the other naturally he will try to do so he'll make a good fight for it i dare say but whether he can keep fishkey from the footlights is an open question i know he's in debt and i don't very clearly see how they are to live 
she is very fond of him isn't she yes i believe so she jilted hamley a man who worshipped her to take up with luscombe so i suppose it was a case of real affection i was told that she was in very bad health consumptive that sort of little person is always dying answered the other carelessly it is part of the metier the marguerite gautier drooping lily kind of young woman but i believe this one is sickly christabel heard every word of this conversation heard and understood for the first time that her renunciation of her lover had been useless that the reparation she had deemed it his duty to make was past making that the woman to whose wounded character she had sacrificed her own happiness was false and unworthy she had been fooled betrayed by her own generous instincts her own emotional impulses it would have been better for her and for angus if she had been more worldly minded less innocent of the knowledge of evil she had blighted her own life and perhaps his for an imaginary good nothing had been gained to any one living by her sacrifice i thought i was doing my duty she told herself helplessly as she sat looking out at the dark water above which the moon was rising in the cloudless purple of a southern night oh how wicked that woman was to hide the truth from me to let me sacrifice my love and my lover knowing her own falsehood all the time and now she is the wife of another man how she must have laughed at my folly i thought it was angus who had deserted her and that if i gave him up his own honourable feeling would lead him to atone for the past wrong and now i know that no good has been done only infinite evil she thought of angus a lonely wanderer on the face of the earth jilted by the first woman he had loved renounced by the second with no close ties of kindred uncared for and alone it was hard for her to think of this whose dearest hope had once been to devote her life to caring for him and cherishing him prolonging that frail existence by the tender ministrations of a boundless love she pictured him in his loneliness careless of his health wasting his brief remnant of life reckless hopeless indifferent god grant he may fall in love with some good woman who will cherish him as i would have done was her unselfish prayer for she knew that domestic affection is the only spell that can prolong a fragile life it was a weak thing no doubt next morning when she was passing through the hall of the hotel to stop at the desk on which the visitor's book was kept and to look back through the signatures of the last three weeks for that one familiar autograph which she had such faint chance of ever seeing again in the future how boldly that one name seemed to stand out from the page and even coming upon it after a deliberate search what a thrill it sent through her veins the signature was as firm as of old she tried to think that this was an indication of health and strength but later in the same day when she was alone in her sitting-room and her tea was brought to her by a german waiter one of those superior men whom it is hard to think of as a menial she ventured to ask a question there was an englishman staying here about three weeks ago a mr hamley do you remember him she asked the waiter interrogated himself silently for half a minute and then replied in the affirmative was he an invalid not quite an invalid madam he went out a little but he did not seem robust he never went to the opera or to any public entertainment he rode a little and drove a little and read a great deal he was much fonder of books than most english gentlemen do you know where he went when he left here he was going to the italian lakes christabel asked no further question it seemed to her a great privilege to have heard even so much as this there was very little hope that in her road of life she would often come so nearly on her lost lover's footsteps she was too wise to desire that they should ever meet face to face that she leonard's wife should ever again be moved by the magic of that voice thrilled by the pathos of those dreamy eyes but it was a privilege to hear something about him she had lost to know what spot of earth held him what skies looked down upon him End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Mount Royal, Volume Two by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight I Have Put My Days and Dreams Out of Mind. It was the end of May when Christabel and her husband went back to England and to Mount Royal. 
leonard wanted to stay in london for the season and to participate in the amusements and dissipation of that golden time but this his wife most steadfastly refused she would be guilty of no act which could imply want of respect for her beloved dead she would not make her curtsy to her sovereign in her new character of a matron or go into society within the year of her aunt's death you will be horribly moped in cornwall remonstrated leonard everything about the place will remind you of my poor mother we shall be in the dolefuls all the year i would rather grieve for her than forget her answered christabel it is too easy to forget well you must have your own way i suppose you generally do retorted leonard churlishly and after having dragged me about a lot of mouldy old french towns and made me look at churches and roman baths and the sights of ancient circuses until i hated the very name of antiquity you will expect me to vegetate at mount royal for the next six months i don't see any reason why a quiet life should be mere vegetation said christabel but if you would prefer to spend part of the year in london i can stay at mount royal and get on uncommonly well without me cried leonard i perfectly comprehend your meaning but i am not going in for that kind of thing you and i must not offer the world another example of the semi-attached couple or else people might begin to say you had married a man you did not care for i will try and make your life as agreeable as i can at the manor leonard christabel answered with supreme equanimity it was an aggravation to her husband that she so rarely lost her temper so long as you do not ask me to fill the house with visitors or to do anything that might look like want of reverence for your mother's memory look ejaculated leonard what does it matter how things look we both know that we are sorry for having lost her that we shall miss her more or less every day of our lives visitors or no visitors however you needn't invite any people i can rub on with a little fission and boten they went back to mount royal where all things had gone as if by clockwork during their absence under miss bridgman's sage administration to relieve her loneliness christabel had invited two of the younger sisters from shepherd's bush to spend the spring months at the manor house and these damsels tall vigorous active had revelled exceedingly in all the luxuries and pleasures of a rural life under the most advantageous circumstances they had scoured the hills had rifled the hedges of their abundant wild flowers had made friends with all christabel's chosen families in the surrounding cottages had fallen in love with the curate who was doing duty at minster and forabury had been buffeted by the winds and tossed by the waves in many a delightful boating excursion had climbed the rocky steeps of tintagel so often that they seemed to know every stone of that ruined citadel and now had gone home to shepherd's bush their cheeks bright with country bloom and their meagre trunks overshadowed by a gigantic hamper of country produce christabel felt a bitter pang as the carriage drew up to the porch and she saw the neat little figure in a black gown waiting to receive her thinking of that tall and noble form which should have stood there the welcoming arms which should have received her rewarding and blessing her for her self-sacrifice the sacrifice had been made but death had swallowed up the blessing and reward and in that intermediate land of slumber where the widow lay there could be no knowledge of gain no satisfaction in the thought of her son's happiness even granting that leonard was supremely happy in his marriage a fact which christabel deemed open to doubt no there had been nothing gained except that diana tregonell's last days had been full of peace her one cherished hope realized on the very threshold of the tomb christabel tried to take comfort from this knowledge if i had denied her to the last if she had died with her wish ungratified i think i should be still more sorry for her loss she told herself there was bitter pain in the return to a home where that one familiar figure had been the central point the very axis of life jessie led the new mrs tregonell into the panelled parlour where every object was arranged just as in the old days the tea-table on the left of the wide fireplace the large low armchair and the book-table on the right the room was bright with white and crimson may azaleas tea-roses i thought it was best for you to get accustomed to the rooms without her said jessie in a low voice as she placed christabel in the widow's old chair and helped to take off her hat and mantle and i thought you would not like anything changed not for worlds the house is a part of her in my mind it was she who planned everything as it now is just adding as many new things as were needful to brighten the old i will never alter a detail unless i am absolutely obliged i am so thankful to hear you say that major bree is coming to dinner 
he wanted to be among the first to welcome you i hope you don't mind my having told him he might come i shall be very glad to see him he is a part of my old life here i hope he is very well splendid the soul of activity and good temper i can't tell you how good he was to my sisters taking them about everywhere i believe they both went away deeply in love with him or at least with their affections divided between him and mr ponsonby mr ponsonby was the curate a bachelor and of pleasing appearance leonard had submitted reluctantly to the continued residence of miss bridgman at mount royal he had been for dismissing her as a natural consequence of his mother's death but here again christabel had been firm jessie is my only intimate friend she said and she is associated with every year of my girlhood she shall be no trouble to you leonard and she will help me to save your money this last argument had a softening effect mr tregonell knew that jessie bridgman was a good manager he had affected to despise her economies while it was his mother's purse which was spared but now that the supplies were drawn from his own resources he was less disposed to be contemptuous of care in the administrator of his household major brie was in the drawing-room when christabel came down dressed for dinner looking delicately lovely in her flowing gown of soft dull black with white flowers and white crape about her neck the major's cheerful presence did much to help mr tregonell and his wife through that first dinner at mount royal he had so many small local events to tell them about news too insignificant to be recorded in jessie's letters but not without interest for christabel who loved place and people then after dinner he begged his hostess to play declaring that he had not heard any good music during her absence and christabel who had cultivated her musical talents assiduously in every interval of loneliness and leisure which had occurred in the course of her bridal tour was delighted to play to a listener who could understand and appreciate the loftiest flights in harmony the major was struck with the improvement in her style she had always played sweetly but not with this breath and power you must have worked very hard in these last few months he said yes i made the best use of every opportunity i had some lessons from a very clever german professor at nice music kept me from brooding on my loss she added in a low voice i hope you will not grow less industrious now you have come home said the major most women give mozart and beethoven to the winds when they marry shut up their piano altogether or at most aspire to play a waltz for their children's dancing i shall not be one of those music will be my chief pursuit now the major felt that although this was a very proper state of things from an artistic point of view it argued hardly so well for the chances of matrimonial bliss that need of a pursuit after marriage indicated a certain emptiness in the existence of the wife a life closed and rounded in the narrow circle of a wedding ring hardly leaves room for the assiduous study of art and now began for christabel a life which seemed to her to be in some wise a piece of mechanism an automatic performance of daily recurring duties an hourly submission to society which had no charm for her a life which would have hung as heavily upon her spirit as the joyless monotony of a convict prison had it not been for the richness of her own mental resources and her love of the country in which she lived she could not be altogether unhappy roaming with her old friend jessie over those wild romantic hills or facing the might of that tremendous ocean grand and somewhat awful even in its calmest aspect nor was she unhappy seated in her own snug morning-room among the books she loved books which were always opening new worlds of thought and wonder books of such inexhaustible interest that she was often inclined to give way to absolute despair at the idea of how much of this world's wisdom must remain unexplored even at the end of a long life de quincey has shown by figures that not the hardest reader can read half the good old books that are worth reading to say nothing of those new books daily claiming to be read no for a thoroughly intellectual woman loving music loving the country tender and benevolent to the poor such a life as christabel was called upon to lead in this first year of marriage could not be altogether unhappy here were two people joined by the strongest of all human ties and yet utterly unsympathetic but they were not always in each other's company and when they were together the wife did her best to appear contented with her lot and to make life agreeable to her husband she was more punctilious in the performance of every duty she owed him than she would have been had she loved him better she never forgot that his welfare was a charge which she had taken upon herself to please the kinswoman to whom she owed so much the debt was all the more sacred since she to whom it was due had passed away to the land where there is no knowledge of earthly conduct 
the glory of summer grew and faded the everlasting hills changed with all the varying lights and shadows of autumn and winter and in the tender early spring when all the trees were budding and the hawthorn hedges were unfolding crinkly green leaves among the brown christabel's heart melted with a new strange emotion of maternal love a son was born to the lord of the manor and while all boscastle rejoiced at this important addition to the population christabel's pale face shone with a new radiance as the baby face looked up at her from the pillow by her side eyes clear and starlike with a dreamy far-away gaze which was almost more lovely than the recognising looks of older eyes a being hardly sentient of the things of earth but bright with memories of the spirit world the advent of this baby boy gave a new impulse to christabel's life she gave herself up to these new cares and duties with intense devotion and for the next six months of her life was so entirely engrossed by her child that leonard considered himself neglected she deferred her presentation at court till the next season and leonard was compelled to be satisfied with an occasional brief holiday in london during which he naturally relapsed into the habits of his bachelor days dined and gamed at the old clubs and went about everywhere with his friend and ally jack vandeleur christabel had been married two years and her boy was a year old when she went back to the old house in bolton row with her husband to enjoy her second season of fashionable pleasures how hard it was to return under such altered circumstances to the rooms in which she had been so happy to see everything unchanged except her own life the very chairs and tables seemed to be associated with old joys old griefs all the sharp agony of that bitter day on which she had made up her mind to renounce angus hamley came back to her as she looked around the room in which the pain had been suffered the flavour of old memories was mixed with all the enjoyments of the present the music she heard this year was the same music they two had heard together and here was this smiling park all green leaves and sunlight filled with this seeming frivolous crowd in almost every detail the scene they two had contemplated amused and philosophical four years ago the friends who called on her and invited her now were the same people among whom she had visited during her first season people who had been enraptured at her engagement to mr hamley were equally delighted at her marriage with her cousin or at least said so albeit more than one astute matron drove away from bolton row sighing over the folly of marriage between first cousins and marvelling that christabel's baby was not deaf blind or idiotic among other old acquaintance young mrs tregonell met the dowager lady cumberbridge at a great dinner more medusa like than ever in a curly auburn wig after madame de montespan and a diamond coronet christabel shrank from the too well-remembered figure with a faint shudder but lady cumberbridge swooped upon her like an elderly hawk when the ladies were on their way back to the drawing-room and insisted upon being friendly my dear child where have you been hiding yourself all these years she exclaimed in her fine baritone i saw your marriage in the papers and your poor aunt's death and i was expecting to meet you and your husband in society last season you didn't come to town a baby i suppose just so those horrid babies in the coming century there will be some better arrangement for carrying on the species how well you are looking and your husband is positively charming he sat next me at dinner and we were friends in a moment how proud he is of you it is quite touching to see a man so devoted to his wife and now they were in the subdued light of the drawing-room by this time light judiciously tempered by ruby-coloured venetian glass now tell me all about my poor friend was she long ill and with a ghoulish interest in horrors the dowager prepared herself for a detailed narration of mrs tregonell's last illness but christabel could only falter out a few brief sentences even now she could hardly speak of her aunt without tears and it was painful to talk of her to this worldly dowager with keen eyes glittering under penthouse brows and a hard eager mouth in all that london season christabel only once heard her old lover's name carelessly mentioned at a dinner-party he was talked of as a guest at some diplomatic dinner at st petersburg early in the year End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Mount Royal, Volume Two by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter Nine, and pale from the past we draw nigh thee. 
it was october and the chestnut leaves were falling slowly and heavily in the park at mount royal the oaks upon the hillside were faintly tinged with bronze and gold while the purple bloom of the heather and the yellow flower of the gorse were seen in rarer patches amidst the sober tints of autumn it was the time at which to some eyes this cornish coast was most lovely with a subdued poetic loveliness a dreamy beauty touched with tender melancholy mount royal was delightful at this season liberal fires in all the rooms filled the old oak-panelled house with a glow of colour and a sense of ever-present warmth that was very comfortable after the sharpness of october breezes those greenhouses and hothouses which had been for so many years mrs tregonell's perpetual care now disgorged their choicest contents fragile white and yellow asters fairy-like ferns dijon roses lilies of the valley stephanotis mignonette and cape jasmine filled the rooms with perfume modern blinds of diapered crimson and grey subdued the light of those heavily mullioned windows which had been originally designed with a view to strengthen architectural effect rather than to the admission of the greatest possible amount of daylight the house at this season of the year seemed made for warmth so thick the walls so heavily curtained the windows just as in the height of summer it seemed made for coolness christabel had respected all her aunt's ideas and prejudices nothing had been changed since mrs tregonell's death save for that one sad fact that she was gone the noble matronly figure the handsome face the kindly smile were missing from the house where the widow had so long reigned an imperious but a beneficent mistress having her own way in all things but always considerate of other people's happiness and comfort mr tregonell was inclined to be angry with his wife sometimes for her religious adherence to her aunt's principles and opinions in things great and small you are given over body and soul to my poor mother's fads he said if it had not been for you i should have turned the house out of windows when she was gone got rid of all the warm-eaten furniture broken out new windows and let in more light one feels half asleep in a house where there is nothing but shadow and the scent of hot-house flowers i should have given carte blanche to some london man the fellow who writes verses and who invented the storks and sunflower style of decoration and have let him refurnish the saloon and music-room pitch out a library which nobody reads and substitute half a dozen dwarf bookcases in gold and ebony filled with brightly bound books and with japanese jars and bottles on the top of them to give life and colour to the oak panelling i hate a gloomy house oh leonard you surely would not call mount royal gloomy but i do i hate a house that smells of one's ancestors just now you objected to the scent of the flowers you are always catching me up there was never such a woman to argue but i mean what i say the smell is a combination of stephanotis and old bones i wish you would let me build you a villa at torquay or dartmouth i think i should prefer dartmouth it's a better place for yachting you are very kind but i would rather live at mount royal than anywhere else remember i was brought up here a reason for your being heartily sick of the house as i am but i suppose in your case there are associations sentimental associations the house is filled with memories of my second mother yes and there are other memories associations which you love to nurse and brood upon i think i know all about it can read up your feelings to a nicety you can think and say what you please leonard she answered looking at him with unaltered calmness but you will never make me disown my love of this place and its surroundings you will never make me ashamed of being fond of the home in which i have spent my life i begin to think there is very little shame in you leonard muttered to himself as he walked away he had said many bitter words to his wife had aimed many a venomed arrow at her breast but he had never made her blush and he had never made her cry there were times when a dull hopeless anger consumed him anger against her against nature against fate and when his only relief was to be found in harsh and bitter speech in dark and sullen looks it would have been a greater relief to him if his shots had gone home if his brutality had elicited any sign of distress but in this respect christabel was heroic she who had never harboured an ungenerous thought was moved only to a cold calm scorn by the unjust and ungenerous conduct of her husband her contempt was too thorough for the possibility of resentment once and only once she attempted to reason with a fool in his folly 
why do you make these unkind speeches leonard she asked looking at him with those calm eyes before which his were apt to waver and look downward hardly able to endure that steady gaze why are you always harping upon the past as if it were an offence against you is there anything that you have to complain of in my conduct have i given you any cause for anger oh no none you are simply perfect as a wife everybody says so and in the multitude of counsellors you know but it is just possible for perfection to be a trifle cold and unapproachable to keep a man at arm's length and to have an ever-present air of living in the past which is galling to a husband who would like well a little less amiability and a little more affection by heaven i wouldn't mind my wife being a devil if i knew she was fond of me a spitfire who would kiss me one minute and claw me the next would be better than the calm superiority which is always looking over my head leonard i don't think i have been wanting in affection you have done a great deal to repel my liking yes since you force me to speak plainly you have made my duty as a wife more difficult than it need have been but have i ever forgotten that you are my husband and the father of my child is there any act of my life which has denied or made light of your authority when you asked me to marry you i kept no secrets from you i was perfectly frank devilish frank muttered leonard you knew that i could not feel for you as i had felt for another these things can come only once in a lifetime you were content to accept my affection my obedience knowing this why do you make what i told you then a reproach against me now he could not dispute the justice of this reproof well christabel i was wrong i suppose it would have been more gentlemanlike to hold my tongue i ought to know that your first girlish fancy is a thing of the past altogether gone and done with it was idiotic to harp upon that worn-out string wasn't it he asked laughing awkwardly but when a man feels savage he must hit out at some one this was the only occasion on which husband and wife had ever spoken plainly of the past but leonard let fly those venomed arrows of his on the smallest provocation he could not forget that his wife had loved another man better than she had ever loved or even pretended to love him it was her candour which he felt most keenly had she been willing to play the hypocrite to pretend a little he would have been ever so much better pleased to the outside world even to that narrow world which encircles an old family seat in the depths of the country mr and mrs tregonell appeared a happy couple whose union was the most natural thing in the world yet not without a touch of that romance which elevates and idolizes a marriage were they not brought up under the same roof boy and girl together like and yet not like brother and sister how inevitable that they must become devotedly attached that little episode of christabel's engagement to another man counted for nothing she was so young had never questioned her own heart her true love was away and she was flattered by the attention of a man of the world like angus hamley and so and so almost unawares perhaps she allowed herself to be engaged to him little knowing the real bent of his character and the gulf into which she was about to plunge for in the neighbourhood of mount royal it was believed that a man who had once lived as mr hamley had lived was a soul lost for ever a creature given over to ruin in this world and the next there was no hopefulness in the local mind for the after career of such an offender at this autumn season when mount royal was filled with visitors all intent upon taking life pleasantly it would have been impossible for a life to seem more prosperous and happy to the outward eye than that of christabel tregonell the centre of a friendly circle the ornament of a picturesque and perfectly appointed house the mother of a lovely boy whom she worshipped with the overweening love of a young mother for her first-born admired beloved by all her little world with a husband who was proud of her and indulgent to her who could deny that mrs tregonell was a person to be envied mrs fairfax torrington a widow with a troublesome son and a limited income an income whose narrow boundary she was continually overstepping told her hostess as much one morning when the men were all out on the hills in the rain and the women made a wide circle round the library fire some of them intent upon cruel work others not even pretending to be industrious the faithful randy lying at his mistress's feet as she sat in her favourite chair by the old carved chimney-piece the chair which had been her aunt diana's for so many peaceful years there is a calmness an assured tranquillity about your life which makes me hideously envious said mrs fairfax torrington waving the society paper which she had been using as a screen against the fire 
after having read the raciest of its paragraphs aloud and pretended to be sorry for the dear friends of whom the censor's airy shafts were aimed i have stayed with duchesses and with millionaires but i never envied either the duchess is always dragged to death by the innumerable claims upon her time her money and her attention her life is very little better than the fate of that unfortunate person who stabbed one of the french kings forty wild horses pulling forty different ways it doesn't make it much better because the horses are called by pretty names don't you know court friends flower shows balls church opera ascot fancy fairs seat in scotland place in yorkshire baden monaco it is the pull that wears one out the dreadful longing to be allowed to sit in one's own room by one's own fire and rest i know what it is in my small way so i have always rather pitied duchesses at a millionaire's house one is inevitably bored there is an insufferable glare and glitter of money in everything unpleasantly accentuated by an occasional blot of absolute meanness no mrs tregonell pursued the agreeable rattle i don't envy duchesses or millionaires wives but your existence seems to me utterly enviable so tranquil and easy a life in such a perfect house with the ability to take a plunge into the london vortex whenever you like or to stay at home if you prefer it a charming husband an ideal baby and above all that sweet equable temperament of yours which would make life easy under much harder circumstances don't you agree with me now miss bridgman i always agree with clever people answered jessie calmly christabel went on with her work a quiet smile upon her beautiful lips mrs torrington was one of those gushing persons to whom there was no higher bliss after eating and drinking than the indulgence in that lively monologue which she called conversation and a happy facility for which rendered her in her own opinion an acquisition in any country house the general run of people are so dull she would remark in her confidential moments there are so few who can talk without being disgustingly egotistical most people's idea of conversation is autobiography and instalments i have always been liked for my high spirits and flow of conversation high spirits at forty-five are apt to pall unless accompanied by the rare gift of wit mrs torrington was not witty but she had read a good deal of light literature kept a commonplace book and had gone through life believing herself a sheridan or a sydney smith in petticoats a woman's wit is like dancing in fetters she complained sometimes there are so many things one must not say christabel was more than content that her acquaintance should envy her she wished to be thought happy she had never for a moment posed as victim or martyr in good faith and with steady purpose of well-doing she had taken upon herself the duties of a wife and she meant to fulfil them to the uttermost there shall be no shortcoming on my side she said to herself if we cannot live peaceably and happily together it shall not be my fault if leonard will not let me respect him as a husband i can still honour him as my boy's father in these days of fashionable agnosticism and hysterical devotion when there is hardly any middle path between life spent in church and church work and the open avowal of unbelief something must be said in favour of that old-fashioned sober religious feeling which enabled christabel tregonell to walk steadfastly along the difficult way her mind possessed with the ever-present belief in a righteous judge who saw all her acts and knew all her thoughts she studied her husband's pleasure in all things yielding to him upon every point in which principle was not at stake the house was filled with friends of his choosing not one among those guests in spite of their surface pleasantness being congenial to a mind so simple and unworldly so straight and thorough as that of christabel tregonell without jessie bridgman mrs tregonell would have been companionless in a house full of people the vivacious widow the slangy young ladies with a marked taste for billiards and shooting parties and an undisguised preference for masculine society thought their hostess behind the age it was obvious that she was better informed than they had been more carefully educated played better sang better was more elegant and refined in every thought and look and gesture but in spite of all these advantages or perhaps on account of them she was slow not an easy person to get on with her gowns were simply perfect but she had no chic nous autres with ever so much less money to spend on our toilettes look more striking stand out better from the ruck an artificial rose here a rag of old lace a fan 
a vivid ribbon in the mazes of our hair and the effect catches every eye while poor mrs tregonell with her lovely complexion and a gown that is obviously parisian is comparatively nowhere this is what the miss vandeleurs old campaigners told each other as they dressed for dinner on the second day after their arrival at mount royal captain vandeleur otherwise poker vandeleur from a supposed natural genius for that intellectual game was mr tregonell's old friend and travelling companion they had shared a good deal of sport and not a little hardship in the rockies had fished and shot and tobogganed in canada had played euchre in san francisco and monte in mexico and in a word were bound together by memories and tastes in common captain vandeleur like byron's corsair had one virtue amidst many shortcomings he was an affectionate brother always glad to do a good turn to his sisters who lived with a shabby old half-pay father in one of the shabbiest streets in the debatable land between pimlico and chelsea by courtesy south belgravia captain vandeleur rarely had it in his power to do much for his sisters himself a five-pound note at christmas or a bonnet at midsummer was perhaps the further stretch of his personal benevolence but he was piously fraternal in his readiness to victimize his dearest friend for the benefit of dopsy and mopsy these being the poetic pet names devised to mitigate the dignity of the baptismal adolphine and margaret when jack vandeleur had a pigeon to pluck he always contrived that dopsy and mopsy should get a few of the feathers he did not take his friends home to the shabby little ten-roomed house in south belgravia such a nest would have too obviously indicated his affinity to the hawk tribe but he devised some means of bringing mopsy and dopsy and his married friends together a box at the opera stalls for the last burlesque a drag from epson or ascot or even afternoon tea at hurlingham and the thing was done the miss vandeleurs never failed to improve the occasion they had a genius for making their little wants known and getting them supplied the number of their gloves the only shop in london at which wearable gloves could be bought how naively these favourite themes for girlish converse dropped from their cherry lips sunshades fans lace flowers perfumery all these luxuries of the toilette were for the most part supplied to dopsy and mopsy from this fortuitous source some pigeons lent themselves more kindly to the plucking than others and the miss vandeleurs had long ago discovered that it was not the wealthiest men who were the most lavish given a gentleman with a settled estate of fourteen thousand a year and the probabilities were that he would not rise above a dozen gloves or a couple of bouquets it was the simple youth who had just come into five or ten thousand and had nothing but the workhouse ahead of him when that was gone who spent his money most freely it is only the man who is steadfastly intent upon ruining himself whoever quite comes up to the feminine idea of generosity the spendthrift during his brief season of fortune leads a charmed life for him it is hardly a question whether gloves cost five or ten shillings a pair whether stephanotis is in or out of season he offers his tribute to beauty without any base scruples of economy what does it matter to him whether ruin comes a few months earlier by reason of this lavish liberality seeing that the ultimate result is inevitable with the miss vandeleurs leonard tregonell ranked as an old friend they had met him at theatres and races they had been invited to little dinners at which he was host jack vandeleur had a special genius for ordering a dinner and for acting as guide to a man who liked dining in the highways and byways of london it being an understood thing that captain vandeleur's professional position as counsellor exempted him from any share in the reckoning under his fraternal protection dopsy and mopsy had dined snugly in all manner of foreign restaurants and had eaten and drunk their fill at mr tregonell's expense they were both gourmands and they were not ashamed of enjoying the pleasures of the table it seemed to them that the class of men who could not endure to see a woman eat had departed with byron and bulwer and d'orsay and de musset a new race has arisen which likes a jolly girl who can appreciate a recherche dinner and knows the difference between good and bad wine mr tregonell did not yield himself up a victim to the fascinations of either dopsy or mopsy he had seen too much of that class of beauty during his london experiences to be caught by the auricom stangles of one or the flaxen fringe of the other he talked of them to their brother as nice girls with no nonsense about them he gave them gloves and dinners and stalls for madame angot but his appreciation took no higher form 
it would have been a fine thing for one of you if you could have hooked him said their brother as he smoked a final pipe between midnight and morning in the untidy little drawing-room in south belgravia after an evening with chaumont he's a heavy swell in cornwall i can tell you plenty of money fine old place but there's a girl down there he's sweet upon a cousin he's very close but i caught him kissing and crying over her photograph one night in the rockies when our rations had run short and two of our horses gone dead and our best guide was down with ague and there was an idea that we'd lost our track and should never see england again that's the only time i ever saw tregonell sentimental i'm not afraid of death he said but i should like to live to see home again for her sake and he showed me the photo a sweet fresh young face smiling at us with a look of home and home affection and we poor beggars not knowing if we should ever see a woman's face again if you knew he was in love with his cousin what's the use of talking about his marrying us asked mopsy petulantly speaking of herself and her sister as if they were a firm oh there's no knowing answered jack coolly as he puffed at his meerschaum a man may change his mind girls with your experience ought to be able to twist a fellow round your little finger but though you do keen at getting things out of men you're uncommonly slow at bringing down your bird look at our surroundings said dopsy bitterly could we ever dare to bring a man here and it is in her own home that a man gets fond of a girl well a fellow would have to be very far gone to stand this captain vandeleur admitted with a shrug of his shoulders as he glanced round the room with its blotchy paper and smoky ceiling its tawdry chandelier and dilapidated furniture flabby faded covers to chairs and sofa side-table piled with shabby books and accumulated newspapers the half-pay father's canes and umbrellas in the corner his ancient slippers by the fender his easy-chair with its morocco cover indented with the greasy imprint of his venerable shoulders and over all the rank odours of yesterday's dinner and stale tobacco smoke a man in the last stage of spooniness will stand anything you remember the opening chapter of willem meister said captain jack meditatively but he need be very far gone to stand this he repeated with conviction six months after this conversation mopsy read to dopsy the announcement of mr tregonell's marriage with the cornish cousin we shall never see any more of him you may depend said dopsy with the air of pronouncing an elegy on the ingratitude of man but she was wrong for two years later leonard tregonell was knocking about town again in the height of the season with poker vandeleur and the course of his diversions included a little dinner given to dopsy and mopsy at a choice italian restaurateur's not very far from south belgravia they both made themselves as agreeable as in them lay he was married all matrimonial hopes in that quarter were blighted but marriage need not prevent his giving them dinners and stalls for the play or being a serviceable friend to their brother poor jack's friends are his only reliable income said mopsy he had need hold em fast mopsy put on her lively madame chaumont manner and tried to amuse the benedict dopsy was graver and talked to him about his wife she must be very sweet she said from jack's account of her why he's never seen her exclaimed mr tregonell looking puzzled no but you showed him her photograph once in the rockies jack never forgot it leonard was pleased at this tribute to his good taste she's the loveliest woman i ever saw though she is my wife he said and i'm not ashamed to say i think so how i should like to know her sighed dopsy but i'm afraid she seldom comes to london that makes no difference answered leonard warmed into exceptional good humour by the soft influences of italian cookery and italian wines why should you not both come to mount royal i want jack to come for the shooting he can bring you and you'll be able to amuse my wife while he and i are out on the hills it would be quite too lovely and we should like it of all things but do you think mrs tregonell would be able to get on with us asked dopsy diffidently it was not often she and her sister were asked to country houses they were both fluttered at the idea and turned their thoughts inward for a mental review of their wardrobes we could do it decided mopsy with a little help from jack nothing more was said about the visit that night but a month later when leonard had gone back to mount royal a courteous letter from mrs tregonell to miss vandeleur confirmed the squire's invitation and the two set out for the west of england under their brother's wing rejoicing at this stroke of good luck christabel had been told that they were nice girls just the kind of girls to be useful in a country house 
girls who had very few opportunities of enjoying life and to whom any kindness would be a charity and she had done her husband's bidding without an objection of any kind but when the two damsels appeared at mount royal tightly sheathed in sage-green merino with limp little capes on their shoulders and picturesque hats upon picturesque heads of hair mrs tregonell's heart failed her at the idea of a month spent in such company without caring a straw for art without knowing more of modern poetry than the names of the poets and the covers of their books mopsy and dopsy had been shrewd enough to discover that for young women with narrow means the aesthetic style of dress was by far the safest fashion stuff might do duty for silk a sunflower if it were only big enough might make as startling an effect as a blaze of diamonds a rag of limp tulle or muslin serve instead of costly lace hair worn after the ideal suffice instead of expensive headgear and home dressmaking pass current for originality christabel speedily found however that these damsels were not exacting in the manner of attention from herself so long as they were allowed to be with the men they were happy in the billiard-room or the tennis-court in the old tudor's hall which was leonard's favourite tabagie in the saddle-room or the stable-yard on the hills or on the sea wherever the men would suffer their presence dopsy and mopsy were charmed to be on those rare occasions when the out-of-door party was made up without them they sat about the drawing-room in hopeless helpless idleness turning over yesterday's london papers or stumbling through german waltzes on the iron-framed kirkman grand which had been leonard's birthday gift to his wife at their worst the miss vandeleurs gave christabel very little trouble for they felt curiously shy in her society she was not of their world they had not one thought or one taste in common mrs torrington who insisted upon taking her hostess under her wing was a much more troublesome person the vandeleur girls helped to amuse leonard who laughed at their slang and their mannishness and who liked the sound of girlish voices in the house albeit those voices were loud and vulgar they made themselves particularly agreeable to jessie bridgman who declared that she took the keenest interest in them as natural curiosities why should we pore over moths and zoophytes and puzzle our brains with long greek and latin names demanded jessie when our own species affords an inexhaustible variety of creatures all infinitely interesting these vandeleur girls are as new to me as if they had dropped from mars or saturn life therefore to all outward seeming went very pleasantly at mount royal a perfectly appointed house in which money is spent lavishly can hardly fail to be agreeable to those casual inmates who have nothing to do with its maintenance to dopsy and mopsy mount royal was a terrestrial paradise they had never imagined an existence so entirely blissful this perfumed atmosphere this unfailing procession of luxurious meals no cold mutton to hang on hand no beggarly mutation from bacon to bloater and bloater to bacon at breakfast-time no wolf at the door to think that money can make all this difference exclaimed mopsy as she sat with dopsy on a heather-covered knoll waiting for the shooters to join them at luncheon while the servants grouped themselves respectfully a little way off with the break and horses won't it be too dreadful to have to go home again loathsome said dopsy whose conversational strength consisted in the liberal use of about half a dozen vigorous epithets i wish there were some rich young men staying here that one might get a chance of promotion rich men never marry poor girls answered mopsy dejectedly unless the girl is a famous beauty or a favourite actress you and i are nothing heaven only knows what is to become of us when the pater dies jack will never be able to give us free quarters we shall have to go out as shop girls we're a great deal too ignorant for governesses i shall go on the stage said dopsy with decision i may not be handsome but i can sing in tune and my feet and ankles have always been my strong point all the rest is leather and prunella as shakespeare says i shall engage myself to spires and pond said mopsy it must be a more lively life and doesn't require either voice or ankles which i rather vindictively do not possess of course jack won't like it but i can't help that thus in the face of all that is loveliest and most poetical in nature the dreamy moorland the distant sea the lion rock with the afternoon sunshine on it the blue boundless sky and one faraway sail silvered with light standing out against the low dark line of lundy island debated mopsy and dopsy waiting with keen appetites for the game pasty and the welcome bottle or two of mouette which they were to share with the sportsmen 
while these damsels thus beguiled the autumn afternoon christabel and jessie had sallied out alone for one of their old rambles such a solitary walk as had been their delight in the careless long ago before ever passionate love and sorrow his handmaiden came to mount royal mrs torrington and the three other guests had left that morning the vandeleurs and reginald montague a free and easy little war office clerk were now the only visitors at mount royal and mrs tregonell was free to lead her own life so with jessie and randy for company she started at noontide for tintagel she could never weary of the walk by the cliffs or even of the quiet country road with its blossoming hedgerows and boundless outlook every step of the way every tint on field or meadow every change in sky and sea was familiar to her but she loved them all they had loitered in their ramble by the cliffs talking a good deal of the past for jessie was now the only listener to whom christabel could freely open her heart and she loved to talk with her of the days that were gone and of her first lover of their love and of their parting she never spoke to talk of those things might have seemed treason in the wedded wife but she loved to talk of the man himself of his opinions his ideas the stories he had told them in their many rambles his creed his dreams speaking of him always as mr hamley and just as she might have spoken of any clever and intimate friend lost to her through adverse circumstance for ever it is hardly likely since they talked of him so often when they were alone that they spoke of him more on this day than usual but it seemed to them afterwards as if they had done so and as if their conversation in some wise forecast that which was to happen before yonder sun had dipped behind the wave they climbed the castle hill and seated themselves on a low fragment of the wall with their faces seaward there was a lovely light on the sea scarcely a breath of wind to curl the edges of the long waves which rolled slowly in and slid over the dark rocks in shining slabs of emerald tinted water here and there deep purple patches showed where the seaweed grew thickest and here and there the dark outline of a convocation of shags stood out sharply above the crest of a rock it was on just such a day that we first brought mr hamley to this place said christabel yes our cornish autumns are almost always lovely and this year the weather is particularly mild answered jessie in her matter-of-fact way she always put on this air when she saw christabel drifting into dangerous feeling i shouldn't wonder if we were to have a second crop of strawberries this year do you remember how we talked of tristan and isult poor isult poor mark i think mark one can't pity him he was an ingrate and a coward he was a man and a husband retorted jessie and he seems to have been badly treated all round whither does he wander now said christabel softly repeating lines learnt long ago haply in his dreams the wind wafts him here and lets him find the lovely orphan child again in her castle by the coast the youngest fairest chatelaine that this realm of france can boast our snowdrop by the atlantic sea isult of brittany poor isult of the white hand said a voice at christabel's shoulder after all was not her lot the saddest had not she the best claim to our pity christabel started turned and she and angus hamley looked in each other's faces in the clear bright light it was over four years since they had parted tenderly fondly as plighted husband and wife locked in each other's arms promising each other speedy reunion ineffably happy in their assurance of a future to be spent together and now they met with pale cheeks and lips dressed in a society smile eyes to which tears would have been a glad relief assuming a careless astonishment you hear mr hamley cried jessie seeing christabel's lips quiver dumbly as if in the vain attempt at words and rushing to the rescue we were told you were in russia i have been in russia i spent last winter at petersburg the only place where caviar and adelina patti are to be enjoyed in perfection and i spent a good deal of this summer that is just gone in the caucasus how nice exclaimed jessie as if he had been talking of buxton or malvern and did you really enjoy it immensely all i ever saw in switzerland is as nothing compared with the gloomy grandeur of that mighty semicircle of mountain peaks of which albours the shining mountain the throne of armus occupies the centre and how do you happen to be here on this insignificant mound asked jessie tintagel's surge beat hill can never seem insignificant to me national poetry has peopled it while the caucasus is only a desert are you touring 
no i am staying with the vicar of trevena he is an old friend of my father's they were college chums and mr carlion is always kind to me mr carlion was a new vicar who had come to trevena within the last two years shall you stay long asked christabel in tones which had a curiously flat sound as of a voice produced by mechanism i think not it is a delicious place to stay at but a little of it goes a long way said jessie you have not quite anticipated my sentiments miss bridgman i was going to say that unfortunately for me i have engagements in london which will prevent my staying here much longer you are not looking over robust said jessie touched with pity by the sad forecast which she saw in his faded eyes his hollow cheeks faintly tinged with hectic bloom i'm afraid the caucasus was rather too severe a training for you a little harder than the ordeal to which you submitted my locomotive powers some years ago answered angus smiling but how can a man spend the strength of his manhood better than in beholding the wonders of creation it is the best preparation for those still grander scenes which one faintly hopes to see by and by among the stars according to the platonic theory a man must train himself for immortality he who goes straight from earthly feasts and junketings will get a bad time in the underworld or may have to work out his purgation in some debased brute form poor fellow thought jessie with a sigh i suppose that kind of feeling is his nearest approach to religion christabel sat very still looking steadily towards lundy as if the only desire in her mind were to identify yonder vague streak of purplish brown or brownish purple with the level strip of land chiefly given over to rabbits yet her heart was aching and throbbing passionately all the while and the face at which she dared scarce look was vividly before her mental sight sorely altered from the day she had last seen it smile upon her in love and confidence but mixed with the heartache there was joy to see him again to hear his voice again what could that be but happiness she knew that there was delight in being with him and she told herself that she had no right to linger she rose with an automatic air come jessie she said and then she turned with an effort to the man whose love she had renounced whose heart she had broken good-bye she said holding out her hand and looking at him with calm grave eyes i am very glad to have seen you again i hope you always think of me as your friend yes mrs tregonell i can afford now to think of you as a friend he answered gravely gently holding her hand with a lingering grasp and looking solemnly into the sweet pale face he shook hands cordially with jessie bridgman and they left him standing amidst the low grass-hidden graves of the unknown dead a lonely figure looking seaward oh jessie do you remember the day we first came here with him cried christabel as they went slowly down the steep winding path the exclamation sounded almost like a cry of pain am i ever likely to forget it or anything connected with him you have given me no chance of that retorted miss bridgman sharply how bitterly you say that can i help being bitter when i see you nursing morbid feelings am i to encourage you to dwell upon dangerous thoughts they are not dangerous i have taught myself to think of angus as a friend and a friend only if i could see him now and then even as briefly as we saw him to-day i think it would make me quite happy you don't know what you are talking about said jessie angrily certainly you are not much like other women you are a piece of icy propriety your love is a kind of milk and watery sentiment which would never lead you very far astray i can fancy you behaving somewhat in the style of werther's charlotte who is to my mind one of the most detestable women in fiction yes goethe has created two women who are the opposite poles of feeling gretchen and lottie and i would stake my faith that gretchen the fallen has a higher place in heaven than lottie the impeccable i hate such dull purity which is always lined with selfishness the lover may slay himself in his anguish but she yes thackeray has said it she goes on cutting bread and butter jessie gave a little hysterical laugh which she accentuated by a leap from the narrow path where she had been walking to a boulder four or five feet below how madly you talk jessie you remind me of scott's fenella and i believe you are almost as wild a creature said christabel yes i suspect there is a spice of gypsy blood in my veins i am subject to these occasional outbreaks these revolts against philistinism life is so steeped in respectability 
the dull level morality which prompts every man to do what his neighbour thinks he ought to do rather than to be set in motion by the fire that burns within him this dread of one's neighbour this slavish respect for public opinion reduces life to mere mechanism society to a stage-play chapter nine